Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Skelton, co-author of the book Team Topologies, and with me on uh, this webinar today is Manuel Page, my co-author. Hey everyone. Uh, thank you for joining, it's good to be here, we're happy to share some, uh, some ideas and thoughts with you. Um, so this session today is remote first team interactions with team topologies. And we're running this because, of course, with the recent uh, pandemic, uh, lots and lots of organizations have gone remote first. So we thought we'd take some ideas that, were, that are in, the, in, our, in our book, Teams Apologies, and kind of explain how they work in, in this remote first context. Um, <clears throat> so remote work, it's just about Zoom and Slack, right? Isn't, isn't that it? That's all we need. Well. It turns out it's a little bit more than that. Um, we need some new tools for sure, but we also need to think about working hours, response times, the tone of voice, how we communicate with people, how we make decisions, lots and lots of things. So kind of ground rules and practices for how we work together. And that's something that many organizations haven't really established before having to go remote first. So this webinar today will give you some ideas how to kind of retrofit some of these patterns into your organization um, using some of the ideas in, uh, in team topologies. Um, and ultimately, because if interactions within the organization are, are, are not going well, are not, uh, not of the right kind of quality, um, there's a danger that it's going to kill any kind of transformation that's in place. Um, it will tend to enforce a kind of us and them mentality. And there's a danger that remote working can slow down uh, collaboration, can, can really make things uh, come to a halt. It doesn't have to, as hopefully you'll see soon. So here's the book that I mentioned. Um, so this is the book that Manuel and I uh, co-authored, and it was published in September 2019 by IT Revolution. So we're very happy uh, to have, to be working with IT Revolution on this call. Thank you to the, the IT Rev team for pulling this together and, and, um, and uh, advertising it and so on. It's great to be here uh, working with them. If you have any questions during the, uh, during the webinar, you can, there's two options. You can use the uh, chat feature in Zoom to uh, post some questions in there. So Alex from IT Rev will be uh, looking at, uh, at those questions there and kind of collecting them together for us and we'll have a, a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. You can also use the actual Q&A feature inside Zoom to ask questions in there as well. So just go ahead and, and use either of those options and we'll, we've got some time uh, at the end of the webinar to go through some of those uh, questions and answers, have a bit of a discussion. So the presentation today will cover kind of four things. We'll cover uh, team dependencies. We'll look at ways to set team boundaries and what that really means and some implications for that. Um, we'll look at what we call purposeful interactions uh, and how that can really help to make remote work um, much more effective than it, it, it sometimes is. And then at the very end, we've got a, very, a short section on how we can improve and grow the kind of feedback that we get from different parts of the organization. So first off, let's talk about team dependencies. It's worthwhile saying there's, there are always dependencies inside, uh, any uh, inside an organization of any kind of useful size. Um, even within a single team, there are dependencies. But the key thing here is... We, we, we need to focus on avoiding dependencies in the flow of change. So we have a smooth flow of change uh, throughout the organization. And it's really important to us to, to, to bring to the surface what different people are working on, what different teams are working on, and what different individuals are working on as well. Um, so we can, we can understand when things are going to be finished and so on. And in the book, Team Topologies, we talk about something that we call the Team API. So API means Application Programming Interface. 
it's a it's a way of describing kind of parts of software uh, the, the kind of external um, the the external interface if you like of a piece of software and so we're using a kind of technical term to apply it to a team as well um, and a team api is really describes how that team works for people outside the team <clears throat> And this helps people outside that team to, to understand how to interact with that team as a unit. And so uh, make things much more transparent, much clearer about that, how that interaction works. So specifically on page 48, we say this, for effective team first ownership of software, teams need to continuously define, advertise, test, and evolve their team API. And this is especially important when we're talking about remote work because we can't just walk across the office to someone and ask them how something works. We have to have that thing well, much more better defined um, because we don't have the luxury of, of, of being, in the same, being in the same office. So a team API covers lots and lots of things. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll talk about the artifacts that are owned by the team. That can be services, it can be applications, software, whatever. Um, the approach to versioning and testing by that team um, wiki documentation that the team uses, uh, practices and principles that the team uses, the team's roadmap and priorities so that other people can see what they're working on and get that kind of context. The team may have, may have some preferences for how they communicate, when and how. So if you understand what their preferences are, you can use tools that fit with what the team, how the team wants to work. Um, and last but not least, um, to understand uh, how best to work with that team as part of a wider organization. Um, you'll see, well, we, we actually released uh, some code on GitHub, uh, which sort of helps to define uh, as an example uh, of a team API. Um, so you can go, uh, we've got some links uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but you'll find it on GitHub if you search for team topologies. And yeah, it's very, very straightforward. The idea is just here's, here's a template that we can use to, to kind of explore what, how you would define that team API. So it's listing the, the things we've just talked about here, team name and focus. Are we part of a platform? Do we provide a service to other teams? Um, what kind of approaches to versioning do we have? What kind of chat channels do we use as part of our team and so on um, to help that team kind of really consciously think about and define the way of the other organ other teams in the organization should interact with that team that's what we, that's what we mean by the team api now it's important also to think for a team to think about how what their dependencies are um, to help with the kind of interactions with other parts of the organization and we've also um, put in on github um, what we're calling a team dependencies tracker. It's an example. Um, the example actually comes from um, uh, Spotify originally, I believe, um, but we kind of extended it. Um, and there's a link there to a spreadsheet, an example spreadsheet. The key thing here is, is not in the effort of maintaining some documentation in the spreadsheet, but it's it, we're using it to try and assess how uh, to assess, assess how our dependencies should change. Do we want a blocking dependency on this other team? Is that right? What could we change to avoid a blocking dependency? And the key thing is that each team would be able to visualize their different dependencies. So we can, we can reduce those, that we can reduce the dependencies that are in the line of flow. There is some, there are some great examples in the book, Making Work Visible by Domenica de Grandis, also published by IT Revolution, um, uh, which and they had some real, really useful in-depth thinking about, about managing dependencies and, and, and making them visible as you'd expect from the title of the book. Um, some of the practices are, uh, need a bit of adaptation to remote first, but the principles are very, very sound. So if you've not had a chance to look at Making Work Visible, go ahead and, and have a look. Um, and um, try out some of these kind of very practical ways of, of tracking 
uh, into team dependencies. So as I mentioned, the key thing here is we need to eliminate blocking dependencies, dependencies that, that, that get in the flow of change. There will be always dependencies. We're, we're always using some kind of platform. We're always using some kind of infrastructure or other tooling. There's always dependencies, that are, but the dependencies that are, and, and many of those dependencies can be healthy. But what we need to do is, is, is avoid the ones that end up blocking flow. There's, this, is a, this is kind of a large topic, so we're not going into a, a huge amount of detail here. Um, but um, the book Team Topology is, 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 is very much focused on a fast flow of change. So what we're looking to do here is find dependencies, inter-team dependencies that, that block a fast flow of change. We can mitigate some slow dependencies by sort of workarounds and so on, um, or by changing how we kind of schedule our work. And then if you've got dependencies that work for us, if we're using a platform or an API and it just works, we'll keep that. That's not a problem. It's also worth um, looking at the kind of more informal social networks that, uh, that we, um, that we have now, if you're in, if you're familiar with working in uh, an office environment, then these kind of networks will be, will be quite um, natural because you'll, you'll go to the coffee machine, you'll meet someone, you'll, you'll, you'll meet someone at lunchtime, you'll see them by the water cooler, whatever, this kind of stuff sort of happens almost naturally inside a physical, physical building. But when we're all remote, we need to effectively invent these kind of moments as well. Some teams uh, deliberately have a 15 minute or 20 minute kind of coffee break. You'll you go and get a, a cup of coffee or you get another drink and you'll just talk about random stuff during, uh, during that period, nothing to do with work. And, and that this is actually a valuable uh, activity to do because it builds a kind of um, informal network of people and, and kind of um, trust um, and awareness of what else is happening outside of the, the confines of a team. What we're really doing here is creating networks for informal knowledge and future collaboration so that when we need to work with a completely different team suddenly, we've already built some kind of trust and awareness uh, between individuals on, on, on multiple teams. Um, you may have lunchtime talks. You may have uh, departmental or, or whole company conferences. Keep those things and keep, keep them running. The format is different, but have continue with that lunchtime tech talk or that internal tech conference. Um, and the format will be slightly different, but, but keep, the, keep the rhythm of, that, of those kind of things happening. Um, and you have to work a bit harder to include people but make those, don't just drop them just because we're not in the same building. So Manuel is now going to talk us through um, some uh, ideas around setting team boundaries. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me well. So as Matthew said, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about team boundaries and actually kind of group boundaries. Um, so the idea that we actually need to have some clarity around what are teams supposed to know and understand and with whom are they supposed to interact, right? So that's kind of first step for us to, to be able to make this remote first context work is to have more clarity on you know, our kind of immediate surroundings as a team. And so setting some boundaries is, is quite important for that. Um, so in fact, there are different, what we call trust levels, group trust levels or boundaries, if you like. Um, for people familiar with the work of Robin Dunbar, um, what we refer to as Dunbar's number is related to this. Um, Robin Dunbar, through research, not just on kind of modern organizations, but also um, on kind of older uh, civilizations and also around um, 
tribes and not the Spotify tribes, but actually tribes um, living in, in the wilderness. And he found that through time, the size of the groupings that we effectively um, set in place, whether it's you know the, the villages that were built by the tribes or kind of the, the number of people that can be in a team, um, they actually have a correlation to the way that the, the size of the human brain and, and the way that uh, we as humans uh, work and interact. So you can see here on this slide, what it's saying is that an individual social network, so kind of the meaningful relationships that we can have uh, as an individual are actually limited to our capacity, to our brain capacity to, to handle them. So when we're talking about meaningful relationships, we're saying, um, at least I, I know the name of this person, I know in my organization, what is their role? How are they related to, to me and to my team? So that would be kind of a minimum to, to say we have a meaningful relationship. Um, and typically the, the limit on those is around between 100 and 200 individuals. So if you hear about people talking about Dunbar's number is usually 150, kind of the average uh, there. Um, it's quite interesting because Robin Dunbar so he's an anthropologist, he has done a lot of research, and in recent years he kind of um, was looking to validate or not his this idea looking at actual social media networks. And so you might see someone with very popular with 600 or 700 friends on Facebook, but actually as he did uh, in his study, you'll find that the actual number of meaningful relationships where there is some kind of regular contact at least is between 100 and 200. So it's, it still applies um, in this, you know, social media context. So it's the same within organizations, right? And we should be paying perhaps more attention to this kind of natural limitations than, uh, than we do. I also like to point out this article from Ben Ford. Um, ben has a really interesting career because he's coming from, the, from a military background and then he moved to software development. And so he has a really interesting article where he talks about social inflection points. So different kind of group sizes or boundaries where um, it actually makes sense to organize around those. So in this table, in this slide, you can see in the military, eight people form, uh, or up to eight people form a section, 30 to 50 form a troop, and 100 to 150 form a, a company. And you see on the right side of the table, the anthropological equivalent, the things that Robin Dunbar was looking at, uh, you know, the village size, the tribe size, and the um, hunting party size. So if we're looking at the our organizations, we can also look at these um, numbers, these boundaries, uh, and to, to in inform us on, you know, what makes sense in terms of not only size of teams, which is kind of more, um, more common, you know, when people talk about two pizza teams, um, even though it depends on how much pizza is each person can eat, but um, generally we know seven plus minus two people is kind of the the usual right balance for you know the number of people we can have in a, in a team and work, that work effectively together. But there are other boundaries. Um, so up to 15 people, Robin Dunbar found, is kind of the, the group size where there's, they can have uh, deep trust. So I know the other people in this group uh, very well. I understand how they, they function, how, how we interact together. Um, and then you have other boundaries, uh, especially that, you know, that 150 kind of boundary on, you know, beyond that people start to have this us versus them kind of approach or, you know, Another way to see it is they, they start focusing on more the, the local, the, the kind of the local um, work they do that's closely related to them because they cannot actually grasp what's going on beyond this 150 number. So the dynamics change when you cross these different uh, boundaries that Dunbar is talking about. Uh, so we shouldn't expect the same rules and same effects and the same ways of interacting when people are put in, in larger and larger groups, um, it's actually changing. So to put it perhaps more, more practically, I'd like to use this, actually this example from the physical world. So in, in our book, uh, we have one of the, we have about 
12 case studies or, or, a, bit, or a bit more. So one of them is from Auto Trader, uh, which is a UK company. And what they did was on purpose, they, they kind of limit the size of the number of people that can be on the same physical space. So on each floor of their building, uh, they have all the teams that are working the same kind of business domain. Um, so perhaps in, in the Spotify model, you'll, you'd call this a tribe, but they're explicitly limiting how many people can be in that same physical space, same floor. And all those teams on that floor are somehow related. You expect they're going to need to interact on a kind of semi-regular basis at least. Um, so if, for example, all uh, commercial car sales is one of their business domains, then all the teams, not only on the technical side, but also marketing, sales, um, whatever you have that are related to this business domain are gonna sit on the same floor. And this promotes easy interaction between those different teams. Um, you still need to consider kind of individual space for each team, but it also helps promote uh, inter-team collaboration, right? Um, so in a way we're on purpose limiting how many people are on the, on the same floor, on the same space. Um, and so that we can strengthen the, the trust bound uh, between those people that are working in the same domain. So if we look at this, then we might ask, how does this then apply or make sense in the virtual world? Um, and you know, I'm gonna talk about Slack, but obviously whatever tool you have for um, chat communications, um, applies as well, you know, we should perhaps be more purposeful around how we organize our, our, our Slack. Um, perhaps having one huge Slack for everyone uh, in the organization, regardless if there are 100 or 300 or 500 people in that organization, is perhaps uh, not a good way to, to set it up, right? Um, because of Dunbar's numbers and those tr trust boundaries, even in a virtual space, people will feel um, that perhaps they don't really belong to this big group. Um, they might find that it's hard to find information, that there's a lot of noise. Perhaps there are, there are a lot of channels that they're supposed to look into. Um, and so they feel like that's taking up a lot of their, their time and just makes it hard to understand with whom should I be interacting on which channel or which person should I ask for help on this topic. Um, there's you know, too much noise if we don't have kind of more intentional way to organize our virtual space, just like the physical space at, um, in, at the auto trader example. So perhaps something more meaningful is that we start having different slacks or whatever um, instances of the tools that you use to match the different kind of um, groupings that make sense along uh, the, those trust boundaries you've seen before. So, you know, translating the case from Auto Trader, perhaps it makes sense to have a Slack uh, per business domain, right? So we're limiting uh, explicitly to kind of that, um, perhaps that 150 number or even, or even less, uh, around 50 people that can be in the same Slack. So there's, that promotes a feeling of, okay, I know everyone, who is here, I kind of understand the different channels, what their purpose is, I'm not really lost looking for information or I'm not really struggling to uh, respond to what's being asked from me uh, because the things are, are the communications and the channels and the, uh, everything is, is much more clear for me. And then inside each of these slacks, we can have of course some conventions and some ways of setting up the channels that are useful. Uh, that can actually promote the right kinds of interactions or the interactions we expect to need between teams. So in this slide, we, you can see there are obviously some channels uh, per team. Each team should have their channel where they feel comfortable uh, and they, you know, they have frequent communication throughout the day, possibly. Um, that's kind of uh, standard. But then you might have, if you look at the bottom left um, channels, you have ST1 platform monitoring. So for example, that might be a channel that we set up when we know that you know, stream team one, so some kind of delivery team, it has to collaborate with a platform team on a mon monitoring service, for example. So we are being much more purposeful where we say we need this channel because there's this 
interaction going on where we're trying to find out, sort out how this monitoring service is actually going to work. Um, you know, what is the interface? What is the, the, the data that the, the stream team needs? Whatever it might be, we're setting this space so that we have this, um, we know exactly where that collaboration and that interaction should take place. Obviously the two teams are free to decide other means of communication and, or just use video calls or what, or what have you. But if they want a channel to be able to communicate regularly, then it would make sense to have one specific for that. Um, and another example, if you look at the right side at the top, you have a channel, for example, support logging. So if one service, uh, sorry, one team provides a service around logging to, another, to other teams, then probably makes sense to have a support channel, right? So I know if I'm a consumer of that service that I know exactly where I have to go to uh, post a question because I'm having some difficulty understanding the logging or having some, um, some other sort of issue. I know exactly where I have to go, right? This clarifies and avoids kind of the effort to, for me as a consumer to have to understand with whom I have to talk, uh, where should I post this question? Is it email or, um, or how should I reach out to this team or this person that I need help from? And kind of at the member individual level, you would expect of course to have at least the name of the person, the, the team they work for. So here in this example, you have Mary works for the platform team and she's an engineer. You know, some useful information. So when we're browsing the uh, Slack, in this case, we, we know exactly who we're looking for. We can search for, for the team and find who people who are in that team or we can search for a specific person. Just a quick note, in, in this example of these channels, um, I'm, we use the, the terms of the topologies that we talk about in the book, so stream teams, platform teams, enabling teams, um, which are these four, but it can be whatever makes sense for your organization. If, you're talk, if you talk about if you, application teams, support teams, then use those in the, in the channel names. Um, so really what I've been talking about here is, is a little bit some kind of conventions and some team focused conventions that help us discover uh, how communication is supposed to happen and reduce the noise. Um, don't take this as kind of definitive rules. It's just some starting points to think about how can we make the virtual space easier to understand, navigate and, and find the communication and respond to other people's um, requests from, from us. This kind of team focus conventions actually help increase the discoverability and reduce the cognitive load, the effort um, around communications for everyone. So I'm gonna switch back to Matthew. So we're now going to look at uh, what we call purposeful interactions and how these can help in a remote first world. And it's worthwhile starting off by uh, doing a bit of myth busting. There's quite a lot of fairly naive articles out there that say, oh, well, we just need to communicate more. We need to collaborate more. Well, it's a little bit more involved than that uh, for quite a lot of reasons. There's some really interesting research that uh, came out in 20, uh, 2018 uh, by some researchers at uh, Harvard Business School. And they actually found that um, in, a, in, a, in a knowledge work context where we're doing uh, kind of discovery and, and, um, and, and innovation, that actually uh, organizations that had everyone talking to everyone else all the time actually performed worse than situations where we had teams of people, groups of people who communicated and collaborated uh, on a more occasional basis. So some really interesting uh, kind of research that's coming out uh, to actually kind of, um, to, to, to back up these ideas or that, that strongly indicate that actually we need to be a bit more purposeful, like Manuel said, a bit more purposeful about the kind of uh, communication and interactions that we have with other groups in, in the organizations if we want the best outcomes. And you can think of it like this. 
to get really effective teams, the key is to have well-defined interactions between those teams. If you think of it from a software point of view, that's kind of like defining how different parts of the software system interact. That's kind of like API design or architecture. And you would, that's not surprising to, for those of us who come from a software architecture background that you know, it's worth putting some effort into defining how different bits talk to each other. And we're taking the same kind of approach and, uh, into the organization, into the kind of human side of the organization, the social side of the organization and say, let's be a bit more purposeful, particularly now that we're remote about how different groups interact. For, to get better outcomes. Now, in the Team Topologies book, we um, define uh, three core team interaction modes. And they're collaboration, which is two teams working together for a specific uh, period of time for, for a, for a well-defined outcome. We've got X as a service with one team providing, one team consuming something. And we've got facilitating which is one team kind of helping another team to, to, to improve or discover something or, 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 so, or something similar. Um, now, really, all of these are time bound as well. They all have a kind of specific time frame. Um, so collaboration really for us needs to, it, it, collaboration can be good or bad. If collaboration is going on for a very long period of time, it's probably a bad thing because we shouldn't need to. It's a suggestion that, that, that there's, there's capability missing or there's functionality missing. Um, and it's also kind of very intense to have to, to, to collaborate with another uh, group with different skills over a long period of time. Um, X as a service might go on for longer if we've got a nice service, a nice API, and we're happy to consume that, and it just works for us, that's great. But we should still be kind of testing, is the boundary in the right place? Has the business context changed? Has the, has the, has the user, have user needs changed? Do we need to shift where the boundary of responsibility lies for that thing that we're consuming? Should, should we be doing more work as a team or should the service provider be doing more work? So we're always, we're always, we're always thinking, uh, is this still the right thing? Uh, is this kind of interaction still the right kind of interaction now? It was great six months ago. Is it still the right thing now? Um, and, and a similar thing happens with facilitating interaction. If we've got one team helping another team, if it's going on for you know, two or three weeks, that's probably a good thing. Uh, if it's still going on, if that facilitating interaction is still going on after seven months, probably something isn't quite right there. That's a question we should be asking ourselves. Um, so when we're drawing diagrams like these, um, so this is this is from the book, by the way. But we we um, we've uh, the, the idea is you can we can draw diagram, diagrams like these to represent what's happening in our organisation at any one time. Um, this is just a snapshot. This is not a a design for the organisation. This is what's happening now, or this is what's this is perhaps what's going to happen in two months' time. And that's a really important thing. It's a, it's a moment in time. It's not a kind of fixed design for how things uh, should, uh, should work uh, without any change. By the way, we're working on some uh, digital templates for these kind of uh, images. And we'll, we hope to have those online uh, very soon in the next, in the next uh, week or two um, for different, uh, different kind of technologies. So you'll be able to kind of easily use a template with some designs like this to be able to model uh, different team types and interactions within your organization. Um, so just again, to, to point to the uh, team API template that we've seen before, um, this, this fits, we'd expect each team to, to fill in the details and make it easy for other teams to discover how to interact with that team. Here's an example. Um, so if we've got a stream aligned team, we'll call them team one. They, may, they, they might have filled in this um, team API template and they filled it in for this specific point in time. They filled it in for their current context. So that's why it says here, teams we currently interact with. They've said, well, we currently interact with the test automation enabling team and the interaction mode we're expecting 
is facilitating. We expect it to be facilitated by the enabling team. We've got a purpose. In this case, it's to understand test automation and so on. And here we've got a duration. So we've, we're setting expectations about the kind of interaction that uh, we think we need to help achieve a particular outcome. And it allows us then to, to kind of test that. So we can say, does the interaction mode feel like it's, it's facilitating? Is, does, that, does that feel right? How, is the duration correct? Does it look like we're going to need much more time? If it looks like we're going to need much more time, what is that telling us? It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a bad or, or, or a good thing. It's just, it's going to tell us something and we should listen to those signals. Um, it might tell us we misunderstood the problem. It might tell us that the, that the platform doesn't have enough features. It might tell us that we need more uh, skills or capability inside our team and so on. The key thing is here, we're defining it, making it much easier to have sensible conversations about the nature of that interaction. Ultimately, we're able to use difficulties or awkwardness in the team interactions as a kind of sensing mechanism to help us evolve the organization in the right way. Uh, so as an example, let's say that the, the platform has produced a new service. If streamlined teams need a lot of support or help to use that service, then perhaps the service is a bit too complicated. Perhaps the developer experience is not good enough. Perhaps the abstraction point is, is not right. Um, Perhaps we need an enabling team to help work out where to put the abstraction, maybe move the API responsibility a bit, and so on. But because we've defined how these interactions should happen, we're able to listen for when they go wrong. And um, it's a kind of, it's a leading indicator. It's a leading indicator for potential architectural and software delivery problems that we can spot quite soon and deal with nice and early. We'll just have a couple of, uh, a, a few ideas about uh, the org chart uh, now. So this is, this is a, a, a typical organizational chart in orange. We've got a kind of very hierarchical view. Again, this diagram's from, from the Team Topologies book. Um, in reality, of course, the actual communication lines are shown in black. Various different people communicate with each other and some parts of the organization are even isolated, shown in, in green there on the right-hand side. Um, so an organizational chart is not, is not fundamentally problematic. It's very, very useful for certain situations, particularly regulatory reporting, um, uh, in, in the kind of more like emergency situations, things like this, um, when decisions need to be made extremely rapidly. But the, the problem with org chart is that for a lot of kind of knowledge work, and discovery activities, it's, we can't have communication uh, only happening up and down the, the different, uh, different branches. And this, this problem with org charts was, uh, was explained very well in a book called Team of Teams by um, a former uh, US Army General, um, um, Stanley McChrystal in 2015. It's a, it's a really, really good book. It's, it's really well written. And he talks about how originally this this was when the U.S. Army was in uh, Iraq uh, fighting uh, Al Qaeda, and he describes how the army at, the, at that time was kind of organized very hierarchically, like the the diagram on the left. But actually, they were facing a threat which uh, had a very different uh, decision making and, and uh, executional structure, like the one on the right hand side. And it meant that they had to radically change their organization to be able to respond to the situation on the ground, which was, uh, which was, which was represented much more by uh, the, that kind of network um, of, uh, of, of decision making. Um, so the key thing here is we need to let real needs drive the interactions between teams, not formal processes or organizational chart um, decisions. And by real needs, we're talking about typically about, you know, user needs. We're talking about meeting, meeting needs of, of, of customers and users, people who are actually using these software systems, which of course is why we have a focus on flow, because we want to be able to meet those needs 
as effectively and as quickly as possible. What we don't want to be is in this situation. This, uh, this was a, a, a tweet from uh, August 2019. So this, um, this poor person here, Justin Garrison, was talking about how he had, I had a manager tell me I couldn't have lunch with my friends anymore because they were on the dev team and he was opt. And he didn't want communication to happen between teams that didn't go through him. That's the kind of thing we're trying to avoid um, by by using these uh, instead, by using these kind of well-defined interactions, team APIs and interaction patterns to be able to say, we need to communicate with, with this other team in order to build this part of the system. Um, so fundamentally, we're trying to clarify um, the, the purpose and kind of mechanisms or channels through which uh, communication needs to happen. Um, this is an example for a platform. So we call this the thin platform template. In, in our book, we talk about um, thinnest viable platform. And this is a kind of example uh, template for listing out what a platform provides. So we've got things like um, hours of operation, a, a, a brief description of a service. We've got some documentation for onboarding, some kind of typical response times, a roadmap and so on, kind of which, which Slack channels or Teams channels we should use, telephone numbers, and so on. This is effectively a kind of a, a socio-technical API around a service. It's not just the, the code level API, it's the kind of, it's an API that speaks to human beings as well and allows us to understand how we act with that, with this particular part of the platform. So again, we're, we're surfacing, we're bringing to the service and making, we bring to the surface and making much clearer what we, expect to provide or what we expect other people to consume. We're defining how, it, how those interactions need to work to be effective. So we've seen this, there's, a, there's some, there's some um, service details, how to report an incident and so on. So Manuel will um, wrap up this, uh, this, this part of the presentation webinar now on, uh, on feedback. Thank you, Matthew. Share my screen. So this is a short section. We're getting to the end. Um, but just to highlight the importance of feedback, right? Um, not just the fact that we all need feedback, and the more you know, the more we are working in a remote world, uh, the more we need to again be intentional about feedback. But also understanding that it's actually a skill being able to give constructive feedback, especially between different teams. Inside the team, you tend to have more leeway, if you like, to have more ways of clarifying um, you know, the tone and clarifying the message inside the team. But between different teams, it can be a little bit more um, complicated. So this is effectively, if you like, a call to action um, to make sure you are growing this the skill of giving constructive feedback. There are many resources, so this is not um, focus of, of our book or this presentation, um, but it's, it's actually a skill that needs to um, be built in, in teams and in individuals, um, especially to provide feedback to other teams. And I like to give this example from a company in the US called Twilio. They have a platform team and I believe every quarter they send out this survey to all the, the teams that consume the platform. And you can see here, they're asking them to express, you know, how do you feel that the platform helps you build, deliver and run your services? And also how compelling is it? Do you feel that the tools are kind of the right tools for the job, um, that we listen to your feedback? So this is um, quite important. So they're asking for feedback to understand if they are, if they themselves are, are providing feedback um, to the consuming teams. And so it's a very simple way, if you think about it, of just making sure we have regular uh, constructive feedback and that we don't kind of leave it, you know, we can that we put feedback at the forefront, uh, especially around the team interaction mechanism to 
kind of assess if the feedback uh, or if the interactions are carrying out are happening as, as expected and, and detect signals where actually, you know, if the platform services actually have a lot of problems with some services or I've voiced my uh, concern or about the usability and I have not gotten an answer from the platform team, then those are things we can then pick up. Um, so through feedback, we then can uh, pick up signals of uh, issues that need to be addressed. And kind of to wrap up, um, you know, this is, these are uncertain times for everyone around the world. Um, and then when we talk about uh, remote work and inter-team um, communication interactions, um, really what we need to do is, is to experiment as well around that. Um, so if you are a manager of a team or a number of teams, um, you actually need to try out which of these things work. Does this uh, sending out a survey like Twilio, does it make sense for you? Did you actually get uh, feedback, something that you can continue? Or you, know, you might try other things that don't work as well and you need to kind of um, pivot a little bit to, to something else. Um, but essentially, we need to be focused on you know, providing constructive feedback, being able to grow that skill of, of giving feedback and try out techniques that make sense for organization and that help us um, get that feedback. So again, some of the ideas or most of the ideas in this webinar are coming from the book Team Topologies, um, applied now to specifically to remote first context. Um, at the time that we wrote the book, obviously, um, it was more of a, of a mixed um, focus. So we talk about you know, organizing physical spaces, but also a little bit around virtual spaces. And in this, in this presentation, hopefully, we've helped address um, some more qu specific questions around the virtual and remote work. Um, we are actually working right now in collaboration with IT Revolution. Um, on a free workbook, probably will be called, called Team Topologies for Remote Teams, um, which we, we are aiming to get um, out there uh, available to everyone, for everyone to download as, um, as PDF probably, um, you know, as soon as possible so that people can use these resources to um, improve their, their ways of working in, in this current remote first context. As we were talking about team interactions and collaboration, you know, this is the purpose of our collaboration with IT Revolution, um, is to, to get this workbook out. And you know, the duration we expect is um, hopefully um, until end of May, uh, this, this will be made available. We do training around uh, different aspects of the book. So we go into more depth and uh, with case studies and exercises and so on. We've actually moved everything um, to uh, remote friendly training, half days uh, that we have available. So if you're interested in that, have a look at teamtopologies.com slash training. Um, we are putting out a schedule with some public sessions around some of these courses, but obviously we also do private sessions for um, customers. We also do remote friendly assessments, meaning that we set up all the, the assessment uh, implementation in a way that allows, um, allows us to do that with uh, close collaboration with the clients, uh, all remotely, of course. If you want more resources around remote first, so some of the things we've seen here and some other um, talks and articles and so on, um, in this link, kimtopologies.com slash remote first, uh, you can find that. And that's essentially the end presentation. We want to thank you for attending for your time and we hope it was useful. And now we can go on to the Q&A. Hey everybody, Alex here from IT Revolution. I've been taking a log of all the questions that you've been putting up during the session, so I'm going to ask them all now. Uh, for timing, it appears as though we have, let's see, 15 questions. I've seen you've answered a couple in chat, Matthew, so it looks about 13. 
give you a sense of how long we have for each one. First one, uh, what do you mean by team dependencies? Okay, good question. Uh, so team dependency is, um, so your team is building some software, let's say, or involved in providing a service. In order to build that software or provide a service, there'll be things that you need from other parts of the organization or even other uh, organizations entirely. You might rely on a, on a, on a cloud-based logging service or metric service, something like that. Almost certainly, if you're doing anything in, in the cloud, you've got dependencies on cloud infrastructure. So that's a dependency. The key thing is, do you have to put in a request to that team to do something to enable you to go ahead and release your software during that week? Or can you just consume that stuff? Does, does that dependency block you, basically, in your typical normal work? And if it's, if, it's, if it's something that we call a blocking dependency, then that's a problem, and we need to try and avoid that. Um, but if it's a dependency which you rely on and it just works, that's good. That's not a problem. So it's anything on which you depend as a team in order for you to, to, to deliver your changes, your features, your, the, 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 your service, your, your software. I'd say another way to look at that is if, you, if it's a hard dependency that it, it stops you and you, which has typically other implications, which is if I'm a, working a team in some feature and I have to stop and wait for, let's say, for example, for infrastructure to be provisioned to me, then I'm going to start working on something else probably. And so I'm increasing the work in progress, which has its own um, negative effect. So we want to move away from this kind of hard dependencies to more what I call soft dependencies where we might need help with some um, platform services that would be useful for us to consume on a self-service basis, or we might be help um, you know, from a facilitating team that's gonna help us um, understand better test automation or you know, some other kind of practices that, that we need to do. Uh, but those are kind of capability-based. So they're more soft dependencies. They're not actually related directly to the work we're trying to deliver. Oh, next one. Uh, is the book covering on-prem teams or remote teams or both? Uh, it, it covers both because because the, the principles that we cover in the book uh, are, uh, relate to any kind of team. Um, so yeah, both. Yeah. So in, in this webinar, we just explored some of those ideas in the book and gave a bit more uh, insight in terms of you know focusing on on the uh, on remote teams, but it are the same ideas. Okay, how do you measure performance of remote agile teams? Uh, depends what you're trying to achieve, but I mean the most useful way to 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 measure the performance of a team is: are they meeting users' needs? Are they meeting the needs of the of the the users who are going to be using their service or software. That's ultimately really the only, the only kind of measure that's actually any use. Um, certainly measures of things like velocity and things like that are, are, aren't very useful. Um, uh, if you're in an organization that really wants to see people typing all the time, then that's unfortunate. You probably want to be looking for some other organization to join instead, rather than having an organization that wants to see you hitting keys all, all day long. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it's about valuable software working in the hands of users. It is, is, has always been the, the best, the best way to measure, um, uh, team effectiveness. You can look as well as the, the you know, another great book from Matthew Revolution, uh, Accelerate, if you haven't seen that yet. So they talk about four key metrics, uh, which actually, when you think about it, all relate to what Matthew just said. Um, you know, lead time, deployment frequency, time to, you know, mean time to restore service. It's all indications of how well this team can uh, respond to customer needs and customer problems as well, right? If our service is, is failing, how quickly can we um, have it back up and, and running or providing, you know, a better um, performance? Okay, next one. And just, you know, we had another five or six come in during this time. Uh, what are some methods for handling the challenges of a hybrid team where there's a mixture of some co-located members and some remote, or even just groups of co-located members? For example, a team with members in two offices 
Is it better to split those into separate teams? Or is there a way to overcome the natural tribal forces to make everyone engage, interact equally? That's a really nice question because that's that kind of hybrid in the, in the, in, in between model is where it's not so clear. Um, if you've got fully remote, organizations that are fully remote have to tackle these the kind of problems uh, straight away. Uh, organizations that are partly remote sometimes feel like they don't have to tackle them. Obviously, with the pandemic, most organizations have had to tackle them. Um, so the answer is kind of really the same. It's um, go ahead and use the, the patterns that we've shared today that are in the book around things like Team API, around um, really defining the kind of team interactions and, um, and uh, expectations that you have in terms of your interaction with other teams. And then in that example, the, 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 the question I put forward, if you've got uh, a, a team that's currently split between two locations, then uh, listen to the signals that, are, that, are, that, that you should be able to detect now that you're using the team API. Because if, those, if the two groups in the two different locations effectively end up as separate teams, then you might just say, okay, that's fine. We'll run with two separate teams. Maybe that's the best way to do it. If it's natural to, to, to follow that split, why not? Um, it depends on your, on your circumstance. Um, but certainly, go, you should put the effort into using things like Team API and Thin Platform Template and things like this to really um, uh, raise to the surface the expectations and, and the, 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 the need for certain kind of interactions before you before you make decisions about uh, splitting teams or, or, or bringing teams together or whatever. I would just add quickly, if you're talking about in, inside a single team, and in some cases where you have perhaps just one person or, or two are working remotely and the rest used to be on the same physical space, um, kind of general advice is to treat the whole team as, as remote first. Um, and the reason is that if we have set up kind of our internal team mechanisms on how we communicate. So if we're in a physical space, obviously it's typically, you know, face to face, you know, I'm sitting across you, I'll ask a question. But obviously when one person is remote, that person is not, um, doesn't have capability to do that. And so you start having two different sets of, of mechanisms for communication inside the team. And that's where, you know, you can start getting, um, you know, a lack of, of um, togetherness, if you like, a lack of you know feeling of people feeling like they're not part of a team if they're the they're, they're remote, that don't have access to the to the actual you know day to day communication. Um, so you can kind of use the the idea of the team API also internally clarify how we want to communicate. So if some people are in the office, you know there there's going to be a face to face communication, but then you know identify you know agree previously, when should that, what are the things that then need to go into a Slack or need to go into a document so that the people who are remote are not left outside, right? That's what you, you want to avoid. Because in the end, to be a team, you have to be a, a gelled, you know, um, high trust group of people that communicate fluidly. Well, touching on that a little bit actually is, Somebody is wondering, should we use text chat and video chat to recreate those water cooler moments? That's, that's an option. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, the, 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 the etiquette that seems to work is if you're going to have, uh, if you want to have water cooler, you know, coffee room type chats, then keep that kind of chat generally out of the channels, out of the, the, the chat spaces that relate more to work. So you kind of keep the work channel, the work focus channels much more clean, but have separate channels for um, for things like kind of coffee conversation, that sort of thing. Yeah, and in this remote context, of course, we those interactions that were natural before in the same physical space, we tend to perhaps um, forget about them or not not think about them, and so it's good to be more intentional about that, you know, regardless of which mechanism, if you just chat or you do a video call with, with this person, that those kind of social interactions that were not, let's say, part of the delivery work uh, in the teams, but, you know, you might remember, oh, I used to every, every week go for lunch with 
this person from the ops team and I'm in the dev team or uh, what have you. Um, or I used to meet them at the, at the uh, water cooler, you know, about, you know, twice a week. So try to set that up in, in this virtual environment. Of course, you need to be more intentional and, you know, uh, agree in advance, but why not? It's also good to have these little breaks from your um, remote work inside your teams. And that can also give you some perspective on what other teams are, are working on. And it doesn't have to be directly related to the work you are doing, but it's, you know, helps build the networks, helps build to keep the social interactions, um, but we need to be more purposeful on that. I've got three questions that I'll ask maybe all together uh, related to Dunbar's numbers. Does that sound good to you guys? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Feel free to split them up too. So is the Dunbar number one to 200 for all the contacts you know, or can you have one to 200 at work, one to 200 at home? Maybe I'll split them up and start there. Uh, I don't know enough about the research, to be honest. Um, it, so I, I won't say much more. It, it may well be that you can, you have separate kind of worlds, if you like. One world is maybe a kind of at home and one world is at work, perhaps. Um, certainly if, if they feel like very different areas or spheres, perhaps you get a similar effect there. Um, but it's an interesting question. Um, I think we'll probably take that one away and and, um, and answer that one later. I really like the question. Thank you. Yeah, I think the idea of, you know, kind of different contacts might um, probably make sense. So Robin Dunbar looked at, for example, how, how tribes and how villages were um, composed. So if, if you look at that kind of um, way of living, obviously there was only one context, which was the village and hunting and uh, growing um, food and, and, and so on or, or um, yeah. So yeah, pro probably for kind of the modern, um, modern days, it makes sense that that limit probably applies equally in different contexts, but we would need to check if there's a research around that. Yeah, if anything, it might, it might mean that you actually have to reduce the kind of the size of that expected trust boundary, because if people are maintaining multiple different sets of uh, relationships, one for home, one for work, one for somewhere else, then maybe there is still a human cognitive limit. So actually we need to, instead of 150, maybe in organizations, modern organization, it's more like 120 or 110 people that we should expect to be able to trust well. So it's, it's a super interesting question. I think it's, 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 yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Do you think Denbar's numbers apply to remote teams of people who have never seen each other in person? Uh, are they valid in the same ways as teams where you have performed at least a kickoff where they get to meet each other in a physical setting? That's another good question. I think there's probably research coming out on this kind of thing over the next few months and, and, and years because now it will become a really important thing to study. Um, there has been some study in this area. Uh, in in the past, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's that's gonna uh, that's gonna come out. Speaking from my personal experience, some of the best teams that I've worked on have been fully remote. Like I've never met these people because so I was working in London, and the team I was and my other team members were actually in Bangalore in India, and we had it was an amazing team. It was really really good. We worked really really well together. I didn't even meet them until after I'd finished working for that company. Um, but we, we, we did some amazing stuff. So, I mean, that's, that's personal experience. I don't think it's um, absolutely essential to meet people in person before being able to build a good team. But clearly, you need to put additional effort if you are fully remote to be able to get that a similar kind of togetherness with, with people. Okay. One more related to this. Is there a Dunbar-like number relative to the number of APIs a team has? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, don't know. Um, quite possibly. In, so I, I don't think you would... I, I understand why you've asked, why the question's being asked like that. I think I wouldn't think of, it, think of it in terms of Dunbar exactly. But 
Um, this probably relates more to another context we've got in the book called team cognitive load, which is the amount of, uh, relates to the kind of amount of stuff we have to kind of keep in our heads as a team. If we've got too many APIs to work with or that we're supporting, that is going to increase our kind of team cognitive load and, and make it maybe more difficult to um, do changes or to do other things as part of the team. Um, but it's a really nice question. Maybe that maybe that kind of stuff will get started to started to start to be researched over the next few years. But it it certainly relates to team cognitive load. It implies also that you'll have more contact switching if you, as a team, are su supposed to support all these different APIs. You expect different people on the team to be able to to do that work. Then, you know, if if I have to switch from one API and and in a, uh, an hour later I have to respond to a problem in another API, then I have to do this context switching. And because of the number of APIs being too too big, it's going to take me longer to get my mindset in, in the other one. So it's perhaps even the, you know the knowledge is there, but kind of just even just uh, switching around. Uh, focusing from from one to another to do different pieces of work is, is going to have a cost at that point. Okay, next we've got, do you have a good recommendation on how to monitor team interaction? Um, this is a nice question. So we've actually seen a couple of um, startup companies working on this on this exactly this question and we've we've got some collaborations going with with a couple of them um, it's a it's very early days but um, these tools connect into you know uh, slack or Microsoft teams and uh, version control and ticket tracking and other kind of tools that people use to build software and collaborate on things and they look at the metadata for that, for the kind of in, uh, kind of communication that's happening between different teams and different people, and then extract uh, kind of uh, analysis that says, well, actually, these this group of people is spending a lot of time speaking to this group of people. Somehow, is that right? And um, I think we're going to see some really, really cool, really interesting tooling coming out um, um, in this space over the next year, two year, three years. Um, we have, I think what we have, um, what we know that is more, a bit more mature today is coming from the work um, around the book, Your Code as a Crime Scene. So the, if you ha haven't heard about it, we recommend having a look. Um, so Adam Thornhill, the, the author of the book, also set up and created some tooling, but this is specific to code repositories, right? So it's looking at version control uh, commits and, and has a few it has the, the notion of you know, who is in which team, and you can start getting some kind of social view on, on how the code has evolved. And for example, if, you, if in theory, the different teams are quite independent and own different parts of the system, but then you look at, the, at the, this kind of code monitoring, if you like, and it, it shows you that actually uh, team B had to very often change the code from team A, then perhaps those boundaries are not as clear cut as you, you thought they were. Um, so that has also social uh, and interaction aspect, but then it's, it's missing, of, of course, all the, the data that uh, Matthew mentioned from you know, our communication tools, uh, even um, the meetings and, and you know, if, if you have some tooling to set up meetings and, and that you can tell who was in the meeting and you can also get uh, some information from there, but it's, uh, it's kind of early days. We are, um, like Matthew said, we're, we're looking into that, but it's, it's still under development. It's, it's worth pointing out that, that that kind of communication analysis could, could be misused. And someone's put a question in the, in the webinar chat. It's the kind of analysis that Palantir does, like communication patterns. Um, what we're, for us, we're, 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 not, uh, we're not looking to, to, um, to, to to spy on people and, and, and dive into personal conversation. We're looking to look at the, the kind of metadata between teams uh, to help us work out, well, um, to try and diagnose or detect uh, maybe problems with APIs or problems with, uh, you know, the platform, something's missing, this kind of thing. So actually to help us um, spot that there's a, there's a mismatch between our organizational 
uh, design and the software architecture, which then is a, another leading indicator to tell us that something we might be spending too much effort in in the wrong place, if you like. So it's absolutely not about kind of spying on on individuals. It's, it's really about kind of giving us better visibility into the into the kind of software architecture before it goes live, if you like. Yeah, there's definitely that danger. And um, when we are looking at this kind of tools that are upcoming, that's something we we are concerned about as well as understanding how the data is being. Um, retrieve, making sure it's not misrepresented, it's not misused, um, while making sure at least we, we try to understand what are those possible um, negative effects and any organization adopting uh, those tools should be doing the same. Should be some kind of, um, should be some, um, there should be transparency around how these tools are working and what are they actually collecting and, and how it's being used. Um, so effect, effectively at, at the current time what we recommend is more or less quantitative if you like but more qualitative so we looked we saw that how the team apis can give you information on what are the expected team interactions and so you can ask the teams you know did this actually happen was this how you were um you know this collaboration did it take how long did it take was it what you expected or more what kind of issues did you have and same for things like team cognitive load um, it's not about getting a specific number, what is the cognitive load on a team, but actually how does the team feel about it? Do they feel like they are able to you know, do their work without being anxious because the cognitive load is, is right? Um, or you know, like in that question, they have too many APIs to support, you know, they have to be all over the place and they feel like they're running around firefighting rather than you know, feeling own the ownership of, of the services or APIs. All right, next one. Do you think companies should take advantage of being pushed into remote to make them more distributed when this is all over? What would the, it depends what, what outcome you're trying to achieve. What are you optimizing for there? Um, because for sure, you can get higher bandwidth communication if you're co-located. That's for sure. You can. It doesn't 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 automatically give you high bandwidth, but you can get high bandwidth communication if you're all co-located. And there's lots of kind of things which which are a lot easier. Um, but it may may mean you can you've got a wider hiring pool. You can hire people from much a much wider geographical area all the way around the world. Um, that brings with it some different challenges as well. So, I think f for me the the thing here is to take the opportunity to better define the kind of boundaries between teams, responsibilities of teams. So therefore use the, defining the team API, define, taking the opportunity, taking this opportunity when we have to be remote first to really better define how lots of stuff should work. Practices, what ways in which teams kind of build their trust within the team, how they define what they work on, all of this kind of stuff. It's a great opportunity for that. Um, and the organizations that are going to really come out of this really well are going to be those that take the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I think you start seeing, at least I've noticed a couple of articles with organizations saying we're not, you know, we going, we're expecting after this pandemic uh, that we're only going to use 25% of the offices we had before. But as Matthew said, you know, okay, but have you looked at how, how are you able to keep the same kind of uh, uh, trust and, and performance that you had before, you know, in, in this remote world. It's not just about reducing the cost of the um, office space or the office uh, leasing and, and so on. So there are more variables into play. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Okay, guys, I want to be respectful of your time. We've got some more questions here. We could take these ones offline and then make them available to everybody afterwards. What do you think? Yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be, there's, there's loads. Of, it, if we carried on, it would take us another hour to answer all these questions. So it's really great to see so many good questions coming through. Um, so yeah, I think that would be a really great idea. And then we'll, we'll put some time into kind of uh, pulling together some links and some 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 suggested answers to some of these things um also feel free to reach out to us on you know, social media 
um, we have team topologies accounts also on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, or to us individually with, with questions, we're happy to, to reply. Yeah, so thank you to everyone who asked questions. Apologies, we can't answer them all now. It's otherwise we'd be here for, for a long, long time. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll try our best to answer them kind of offline after, after this webinar is finished and then follow up with some blog posts, maybe this kind of thing. Yeah, I also appreciate everyone um, for your time here and uh, yeah, hope it was useful. Yeah, that was amazing. And just as one last reminder, everybody, the ebook is available for $9.99 throughout the end of the day. There are time zone and sell restrictions. So connect with us at IT Rev Books on Twitter. Connect with these guys with at uh, at Team Topologies on Twitter as well. And thank you everybody for joining. We had a tremendous turnout for this. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.